That is tiny. Is that tiny? rockweed, rock work, no, rock really thrush? Right. You can read that. That's yeah. the one that the... Not very well. <laughs> the MP3 players and things like that. They uh, they had the radios with tubes and radio tubes. That's from Stories can have a powerful impact on our lives. We can learn from them, escape in them, and be inspired by them. The best stories are the ones that leave you wanting to know more, the ones where you want the story to go on and on. Good stories are like that. They stay with you. Maybe it's in the good stories that we become the authors. We add to the story in the ways that fit with us. The thing about stories is, though, you need to learn about them to tell them. Sometimes the learning is just as interesting as the story itself. What I'm going to tell you is a story that probably has as much fact as fiction. We just don't know because it happened more than 100 years ago. We do know the story is about a man, a criminal and prisoner at the Ohio State Penitentiary. He was known as Blinky Morgan. How I got to know this man, Blinky, is a story unto itself. It was a cold and early morning of January 29th when Benedict and Rudy's, a furrier store in Cleveland, Ohio, was entered by burglars. The burglars left with thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. The theft surpassed any other theft in the city's history. The crime was particularly bold. The street was patrolled from sunup to sundown, yet somehow a gang of robbers calmly bored a hole through the front door and were able to open the lock. Once inside, they proceeded to select a number of the finest furs. Allegedly, a wagon, used as the getaway vehicle, waited outside the fur store and was quickly loaded and driven to a boarding house on Sinclair. When it was all said and done, thousands of dollars, more than $200,000 today, of seal sachets were stolen. The Cleveland police were quick to react, and all roads outside the city were ordered monitored per police captain's instructions. It was discovered that Thomas Story, an express man, which is the term they used for delivery men back then, had later hauled the burglars and the stolen furs to the Bedford train station, 12 miles south of Cleveland, where the gang of thieves were able to escape uncaptured. This crime was masterminded by Blinky Morgan. Charles Blinky Morgan was an enigma. He liked to present himself as a charming, well-dressed gentleman, but he could quickly resort to violence if the situation required. He became notorious for his gang of criminals during the late 1800s. Merchant stores and post offices around the Midwest were his main targets. Blinky would mastermind thefts that would only be recognized after the proprietors 
of these businesses would go in early in the morning to open up only to find their safes unlocked and ransacked. Blinky could be a cold criminal. Legend has it, a member of his gang, who went by the name Naylor, questioned Blinky's safe cracking skills. Blinky decided to prove his skills by putting a bullet in the Naylor's head and then left Naylor's dead body to rot beside a river. There are a few more stories like this about Blinky, but not much more is known about him. In the 1800s, he was almost a household name, especially in the Midwest, but now there's very little evidence of his notoriety. It's hard to research someone who is known more by legend than facts. The thing about a story is, there are the incidents that happen that start a story, but it's often myths that finish the story. Without a lot of documentation, you have to make speculations about what really happened and try to construct a portrait of a person who's basically unknown. To make Blinky's story, you have to look at the surroundings during the time of his escapades. His story is made up by the geography of the crime, the merchandise he stole, and by the transportation he used. The story is also made up by the people who know about these things, the historians, academics, and personalities who have all developed a curiosity about the puzzle of Blinky Morgan. What I want to try to do here is take everything I know about Blinky and try to imagine him in this time and place. The goal is not achieved by me alone. The fun part about trying to tell stories is sitting down and collaborating with others that are masters in their field of study and trying to bring a story and a character back to life. My main companion in this tale is Jane Trezillo, a writer who dedicated an entire chapter on Blinky in one of her books. The documentary that you're about to watch follows our journey as Jane unravels the fact about Blinky's most famous heist, the robbery of Benedict and Rudy's. The story has a lot of everything, a heist, good detective work, a daring rescue of a well-guarded prisoner, a shootout, courtroom drama, and finally a protagonist who's hanged from a noose at the Ohio State Penitentiary and a hanging gone wrong, or maybe not. think draws us to to that subject to crime to crime yeah and and the the criminals boy I don't know um you know I'm not even sure you know I I have a degree in criminal justice one of my degrees is in criminal justice and I was a police reporter and I um I just remember, you know, when I was riding with the police and just the clues, you know, here, this step is the next step is the next step. And it's, it's the research again, you know, investigation is, is research. The only thing is, is I think sometimes police, they are looking for evidence. Whereas as a writer and a researcher, I'm looking for facts. And, and I think they're two different things. So the evidence may lead me to something but I have to have the facts and I guess with crime it's finding out what people don't want you to know it's like if there's one last fact by golly I'm gonna find it you know and I can always think of 30 different ways to find it Here's St. Clair. Okay, so St. Clair and Ontario. So that's where the um, the boarding house was, that where they took the furs. Okay, so there's so, St. Clair and uh, here's Superior. Superior. And here's Ontario. Okay, okay. They put the stuff in a trunk. The guy that took it, there was an alleyway behind and he was sitting back there, mm -hmm. but there was an alley there. There, it was. So it would have yeah, been. So yeah. that could, could. This could be your. Yeah. Could be your site. Private. Alley. Private. A private alley. alley. Okay, I bet and that's it. But let's look at the next one. And just, okay. Let's just kind of hypothesize. What do you think that uh, Blinky would have been doing? during the day, from what I read, that there was a lot going on all night long, that there were there was foot traffic, traffic. passed, and to me that's kind of surprising that back then people would have been 
out and about I all think night. We, and it was during the and it was during bad weather. It was in the, the end of uh, January, so you know, it was surprising that. But I think, and what I've learned in my career as historian and you know archivist, that we do romanticize the 19th century, and we think it was this quiet, sedate, where they rolled up the sidewalks at six o'clock. We would never imagine that there was any type of nightlife, nightlife, that there were such a thing as crime. I mean, I've gone through coroner's files, and you know, you find that some of the same sort of social problems that we encounter in the 20th and the 21st century were no different. I know I saw an article once that was talking about the need for gun control because oh. a gunshot had gone off and had hit someone and there was some hue and cry in mm -hmm. the newspapers that we need to change this. So you begin to get this sense of, of perspective that there isn't all that much that's new under the sun. And obviously we are faster paced. I wouldn't say that our life now isn't uh, certainly incrementally and the, and the much more is, in too. Is. But I would still <laughs> think you were not in this, um, you know, sort of a, a small town where, you know, everybody sort of retreated to their, um, their own homes after people got home from work. They probably did the same thing. They went to work, you know, stopped for a drink, stopped uh -huh. at the tavern, maybe had a dinner out, went to any of the cultural activities, concerts that would have been available. You would wonder certainly that even in Cleveland now, no one wants to be out on a January night if it's very cold, cold. and it's very snowy. They might have anticipated things to be a little bit quieter, but remember you're sort of in the center of the city Same. now and you're not sort of on the, on mm -hmm. the outskirts. So when doing the story, and I know this is just a basic question, but I think because there are so many elements, what was your favorite part of it? in regards to the, the trial, the penitentiary, the actual crime, or you know, what was your favorite part of the story? Probably the fur robbery. I liked that, just the audacity that, you know, that Blinky and, and his buddies had. I mean, it had to have been planned out, number one, because they, ha they had to have known what time was the best time to hit. They had to know what was in the store, how they were gonna get it out, they had to know where they were going to take it, and they had to know how they were going to ship it uh, east. So I just kind of admire the planning. It was possible that they chose winter time because Benedict and Rudy's would have more furs on hand, probably more of the expensive ones, and there wouldn't be as many people out in the street because it was cold, so they would have, uh, you know, an easier time of uh, getting into the store and, and, of course, getting the stuff, that, getting the loot, getting the stuff that they wanted. I like to go to wherever the place that they operated, that they lived, and just kind of get the feeling of the place. I'm trying to get the feeling of 1887. Maybe kind of peek in some windows. Wow, this one is really nice, really cool. I can see all the way through. Just to get a feeling of what it was like and what the people saw and what they heard and what they felt. I'm thinking about the women uh, back in 1887 and the type of clothing that they wore, the long skirts, and it must have been kind of hard for them to get around in the snow like this. Certainly they didn't have the boots that we have today, and they had long skirts that probably dragged through the snow. Although the material was probably warm, maybe wool, they most certainly wore fur coats made of seal skin and seal skin hats. And they most likely bought them at Benedict and Rudy's, the store that Blinky, Morgan, and two of his friends stole 
uh, $7,000 worth of furs that morning. Putting yourself into Blinky's air really helps to understand this story. His take in this robbery was around $200,000 in today's money. That's a big deal for only a couple weeks worth of work. The money would have came from the resale of the furs the gang had stolen. We have to go to Kent State University, which has a renowned fashion museum, to find out the significance of furs at that time. has been worn by people since the beginning of time. We can think of the caveman wearing the fur garment. But when fashion develops and into the time when Blinky and his gang went to the fur store, fur worn on the outside was really seen as something that was for a hunter or more utilitarian. It wasn't seen as fashion. So if you think of a big furry coat, that wouldn't have been something that would have been attractive for men or women to wear as a fashion fashionable garment. About the early 1880s, a new technology came where furriers began to learn how to take these long furry guard hairs away from the fur, leaving the soft under fur, and make the fur more like a fabric, that the fabric could be manipulated. And as a result of this, the shininess looked much more like silk fabric and could be made into something like this collar or in into a coat or a jacket. Mostly all clothing was made of wool primarily, but also silk, cotton, and linen. This muff here, which is used to keep your hands warm, especially if you were riding in a carriage, also has the fuzzy fur, including the guard hairs. In the 1860s, in America and Europe combined, 10,000 pelts of seal were used. But by 1880, 200,000 pelts were used. So the technology led to fashion in fur, fur being worn on the outside side rather than on the inside and also to the value of fur. A fur coat in 1887 or the 1880s would be worth about $150 to $200 to buy at a store, which is about $5,000 today. There's an old saying that goes, clothes make the man. In Blinky's case, clothes were about the only thing a man on the run could hold on to. Blinky also used clothes to make him someone he was not, a civilized gentleman. One of the things that makes clothing and clothing of the past interesting and brings history to life is the fact that all of us wear clothing. One of the first things we interact with when we're born is to put a blanket around us. The textiles are part of our life from the very beginning of our life. And sometimes we overlook the importance of clothing because it is so common. But clothing can give us information that has to do with technology, such as the seal skin and how it was processed that can tell us about economics, which is where people were putting their money or not putting their money. It can tell us about the history of everyday life. It can tell us about how we communicate, that clothing is a language. And if Blinky came with this fancy vest and maybe with a new tie and his cufflinks with diamonds on them and his Blinky bling, that he would show you who he was and what he did. In fact, if Blinky was really trying to show off, he might add a top hat. And all of these are communications, nonverbal communications, that tell us about how people lived. And what you wear is our, our bodies have not necessarily changed that much over time. We're, you know, humans have a head and they have arms and legs and all those things. But how we embellish ourselves, how we change our appearance by dress, by the way we put our hair, by jewelry, communicates not only our time, but also individual and group affiliations. The heist had to be planned out to the smallest detail. 
It's not like these guys just broke in and had a getaway car waiting. No, they had to have horses and wagons in place. Then they had to get the goods to a train and not be discovered doing this. Timing was crucial in regards to train schedule and shipping the furs to Albany, New York. In Blinky's time, trains played a large role in the everyday life of citizens. I wanted to get a good feeling of the way the trains were, so I talked to a couple guys who have made working on the old trains their life. Anybody that's never been near a steam locomotive when it was operating, they're very much like a person. They sit there and they sigh and they creak. You know, they drink water, eat coal. Mm -hmm. You know, spit uh, out ash, spit, <laughs> spit out cinders, cause people heartaches, headaches and heartaches and all mm -hmm. kind of pain. It's all part of a railroad train. They used to have, though, what, uh, if a train was uh, stuck on a track or something like that, the conductor or a brakeman would walk on the track, and they have these little caps of dynamite. And they would torpedoes. set them on the track. Yeah, they call them torpedoes. And they set them on the track, mm -hmm. way down the track. So that gives them ample time when an engineer, because they didn't have signal lights like they do today or, or radios or anything like that. So they would set these little torpedoes on the track to warn uh, whatever train's coming next that, hey, we're broken down. They put a whole bunch of them down there. And then when they run over it, it makes a small explosion. They'll know, and they know that, oh, we gotta put the brakes on, and they start stopping the train right away. If you don't remember your past and where you came from and what your roots are, mm -hmm. you got nothing to build on. And this was part of a, a very vibrant, energetic past. After the Civil War, it was just a, a great era of expansion in the whole country, and Ohio was no different. Mm -hmm. Uh, the original railroad that came up the valley was chartered in 1871. If you look at the railroad maps, I mean, just going by, you know, five-year increments, it's just like they blossomed. It's a yeah, slow yeah. motion flower blossoming. Mm -hmm. Railroads uh, they, going everywhere. Going everywhere. So 1880s, the train was probably everything. I mean, it brought in traveling. I mean, it, well, it hasn't been that long since the train wasn't that way. In, in my memory, and I don't, no old guy jokes now, in my memory, you know, when I was a little boy, you didn't call the airport. Their planes were mm -hmm. expensive. That was only for business people with a lot of money. Everybody that was going to go someplace for any distance called the train station, and you found out what trains were leaving. Every, every 20 minutes there was a train going in and out, coming in or going out, you know. It's just like in a busy airport today. But it was in the earlier days, like in the 1890s, you would have to get on a horse to take you to one station to another station that could be 20 blocks away or you know 15 blocks away so that you can catch the next train. That's why they built the Terminal Tower to put all the railroad stations all together in one spot. Cleveland provided a real backdrop to Blinky's exploits. Cleveland was then a thriving Midwest metropolitan city. Rockefeller, who founded Standard Oil in the city, was just one of many capitalist titans who helped with the economic and cultural prosperity to the area. All snazzed up, Blinky could have fit right in on the streets and in the storefronts. We can see what kind of city Cleveland was with photographs. A photo is something that is both real but abstract. It is something that freezes an image at a certain point in time. You can't stop time, but you can capture an image of something that happened. The internet lets us feed our eyes on thousands and thousands of images at just a click. But there's something about holding an actual photo, especially a photo that had to be printed from a negative. It is a layered process that adds to the specialness of the record it tries to convey. Recently, we're looking at a lot of views of Public Square over the last hundred years, uh, or plus, a little over. And it's amazing how we are trained in our mind that when we look in the one quadrant, we're gonna see Terminal Tower. And when all you see are one and two story businesses, it's almost as if you can't believe it when you look at them. Uh, you know, you're, you're seeing the landscape behind 
those buildings, which we never see now because of course we know we have this prominent landmark right there. It actually will throw me for a loop every once in a while when I see one of those because for my brain just doesn't want to identify that area without the terminal tower. And so it's interesting, we, we become very accustomed to the, the landscape that we have. And we're fortunate, thanks to the, the massive collection that we have, that you can see so much more from different, different points in time, see the evolution of, of different areas of the city. Definitely, I think, inspires you to look at the world a little differently. What advantage do you have with a photograph, say, over a clothing collection or an actual, you know, still standing object? Well, I think a photograph can capture atmosphere, capture the essence of a moment. And I think that's the, the beauty of photography is that it lets you essentially travel through time to view a moment that never happened before, is not happening now, and will never happen again. We have a collection of somewhere around 65, 75,000 photographs of the city of Cleveland done by the zoning board. And their job was really to go out and take photographs of buildings. So residential buildings, commercial buildings, industrial, and that's all they're supposed to be. But you know, maybe uh, you are trying to get the, the facade of a building and you know, half a dozen kids run by while the shot's being taken. Or uh, we found one the other day where two kids peeked up into the front of the, of, as the photo was being taken and now we're part of it. And it you know, accidentally provides so much more context. You see all these small little dramas getting played out in these what are pretty much very sort of standard straightforward shots. I mean, there was never meant to be any artistry to them or, or anything other than a basic documentation, but you are capturing snippets of other people's lives and who, you know, who the pedestrians are in them and what's going on. And so they can often tell you so much more than what was ever intended. How did you start your research? Where did you go? What did you... Back maybe in the uh, 1990s, I discovered a kind of nice way to, an inexpensive way to find out about Cleveland was to look at postcards. And so I started going out to the postcard shows and I got tons and tons of these postcards and I really don't consider myself a postcard collector. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I did was I looked at these things and I saw, uh, for example, the same view, how it might have changed over a period of 20 or 30 or 40 years. Wow. And then I started trying to piece together how that changed. Mm -hmm. Were you looking for any particular? No, all I cared about was if it was in Cleveland. I didn't really want to expand this to some kind of a fantastic postcard collection, you know, covering the whole universe or something. So I just focused on Cleveland. And uh, postcards really started coming out in the 1890s or so. Mm -hmm. Even then you had kind of a little bit of a problem because there was a lot of artistic license taken uh, associated with uh, how people drew some of these illustrations. So they weren't totally accurate. And then there was a nice period of time in which because they were photographs uh, you could trust them more. Mm -hmm. But those days are gone now too. Uh, there's <laughs> pictures taken of the new Cleveland Stadium and I was looking at one of them one time and became so interested in it, I actually called the photographer because there was no way on earth that that scene could have ever really existed. And they said, well, yeah, we moved a building or two around uh, <laughs> to make it look nicer, you know, uh -huh. for the selling of the card. Uh -huh. So uh, there was really only a period of uh, maybe 40 or 50 years where you could really trust a, a, a postcard to accurately depict. Wow. what was there. And it's not like every one of them uh, 
was uh, was not accurate, but you couldn't really rely on it just because yeah. it was a postcard. Jane is correcting me several times. I even remember in the reenactment, I threw like a Winchester rifle in there, and she's like, Blinky didn't have a Winchester rifle. <laughs> it's like, but it looks good. Yeah, yeah, yeah it looks yeah, good yeah, over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how hard is it to stay like to be factual and to be not kind of steer a story one way or another? It's uh, harder than you think because you don't even know uh, for sure when you're getting something factual. Uh, for example, you can read a story in the Cleveland Press, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and the Cleveland News, and get totally different interpretations of it. Absolutely different. And, and you know, you could pick one that would fit your you know, political view or, you know, whatever and stuff like that, and you could match it perfectly uh, to that story. But if you read one of the other newspapers, you get a whole different view of it. Um, and that makes it hard uh, because, like, to me, I just like to figure out what actually happened. One of the examples, and this isn't a really good example of what I'm talking about, but the plain dealer was very factual. Something happened and they would give you the story or whatever. The Cleveland Press would take the same event and do it from a human interest standpoint. Uh, like you take, for example, in uh, 1949, the market downtown, Central Market, burned. Well, the PD had a fantastic story associated with the burning and how long it took to burn and how many fire trucks came out and whatever. The Cleveland Press wrote the same story up in terms of the trauma that the individual market owners, people in the market had. I mean, they, their whole life was devoted to the market sometimes. They, they, they learned the business from their grandparents or parents and whatever. I mean, their life savings essentially went up in smoke in this. Well, both of those stories can be very accurate and putting them together, you have a great story. But what if there's a conflict <laughs> between those two that you read. I mean, then what do you do? And that's when it gets harder. Blinky was the nickname given to Charles Morgan for the twitch in his right eye, a scar that some say came from his time served in the Civil War. Others say Blinky used too much gunpowder one time when blowing a safe and was cut when he became the recipient of hot flying steel from the explosion. Gunfight, knife fight, we'll probably never know. Just another part of Blinky's mystery. Blinky Morgan, you know, we don't really know a whole lot about Blinky Morgan. The only thing that we can kind of be sure of was that he was born in Philadelphia in 1834. He was known by a lot of different last names. Some people thought that he came from uh, Liverpool, England, that he was a famous thief over there in England. Mm. Somebody thought that he was from Trumbull County. Somebody else said they, oh, they were pretty sure he was from uh, Ontario, Canada. People even said uh, he probably rode with the uh, James Gang. So we just really don't know. But what we do know was that crime was his job. What was that one piece of research that backed up your thought process on who Blinky was? Probably it would be his escapes from prison. He and uh, Kid McMunn had tunneled out of the prison and he left a note for the warden that said, if I can remember correctly, said something about, you know, we're leaving because the food wasn't good or, or something like that. And I just thought, you know, this guy is, He's just great. <laughs> he's just, you know. Great in what sense, like to build a story around? Or... Yes. Whenever I write a book, I want to tell the story of the people, okay? And so for me to know the most about them, that showed that he had a sense of humor. And it kind of made him more, um, more real to me, you know, more uh, a human, human being to me. And that has to be hard when doing research of that period because you're basically stuck with birth records, death records, mm -hmm. prison records. Yeah. So how did you come upon stories about Blinky? A lot of what I got were from old newspapers, but the best thing is when you find other people talking about them. The next chapter in Blinky Morgan's story takes us to Pittsburgh, where members of the gang relocated to after the fur heist. Pittsburgh has such a rich history, I was worried I'd get too sidetracked from Blinky's story and end up doing a documentary on Pittsburgh itself. Right here, what you are looking at are photographs of the Johnstown Flood, which took place two years after the fur heist, which is close enough, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> the reason I'm using these photos is because one, they are hard to take your eyes off of, but two, everything that's been said by our researchers is applicable. The men on the bridge, the hats and boots, overalls, jackets, suits, and it's safe to say that under these circumstances, an equality exists among the classes in this moment. Being able to peek into people's homes and get an idea of how people lived helps to understand their relationship to one another. Members of the Blinky Morgan gang would most likely be in a boarding house that resembled a similar room. No closets in those days. Folks didn't have as many clothes as we do today. Clothes were kept in a simple armoire. It only took two days after the heist in Cleveland to round up the usual suspects in Pittsburgh, and Kid McMunn was among them. The kid was a noted thief, a true gunslinger, and a known member of the Blinky Morgan gang. Cleveland Police Captain Holm came out to Pittsburgh and made the arrest. He had to wait for extradition papers that were needed to bring his prisoner back to Ohio. In 1887, in order to extradite a prisoner from another state, paperwork had to be signed by the governor of Ohio. So an officer from Cleveland had to make the round trip to the Ohio State House, a magnificent structure that has been restored to its 19th century grandeur. Walking in the space, physically being here, you can go in the House and Senate chamber, you can see the process. This is the arena where debates happen on what we should do in Ohio and what we should not. This is really, you talk about the arena of ideas, this is that space where people from different parts of the state of Ohio come together and work the process. So if we imagine being here in 1887, we're walking up these stairs to the rotunda, we're walking across the tunda over to the governor's suite of offices, and that's where they would have come to have Governor Forker sign that warrant to get our boy in Pennsylvania. You walk through the rotunda and you look up and it's, first of all, it's just awe-inspiring. If this is possible, I'm more inspired by the space just because I know who has walked through here, what has transpired here, the different debates that have on a lot of cases, changed the trajectory of the United States. All this stuff transpired under this cupola right here in the center of, of Columbus, Ohio. So I try to remind myself to look up more than, than just walk through. The Cleveland officer obtaining a warrant from the governor of Ohio at the State House may seem like a side note. For me, it really showed me the pace of the era. Just to obtain a warrant, an officer had to take a train from Cleveland to Columbus, and then from Columbus to Pittsburgh. But for me, I was able to imagine a story coming to life. This officer, who had probably never seen the State House, was surely telling others on the way to Pittsburgh what a magnificent building it was. Once in Pittsburgh, he had to be eagerly welcomed for he held the key back to Cleveland. Or maybe he just read the Pall Mall Gazette and wondered how he could get a fantastic fur coat like that of writer Oscar Wilde. We've covered a lot of ground in better understanding the time and place in which Blinky's crime was committed. So now let's get back to the story. Kid McMunn has been captured and is now being brought back to Cleveland by officers Captain Holm and Detective Hulligan to answer for his part in the fur heist of Benedict and Rudy's. This is where the story goes off the rails. Arriving in Alliance, Ohio, at 3.15 a.m. Three men got on a train heading for Cleveland. Conductor Oberger notified Captain Hone of the new passengers. Captain Hone took a survey of the coach and, seeing nothing to arouse his suspicions, resumed his seat next to his partner, Detective Hulligan, who was shackled to their prisoner, Kid McMunn. The train reached Ravenna about 4.20 a.m the three new villainous passengers reckoned few, if any, folks would be at the depot at that early of an hour. They calculated their chances and decided to make their move. As the train stopped, the villains headed for the smoking car, one standing guard at the door, while the two others, with revolvers drawn, made a rush for the officers. One of the villains struck Detective Hulligan with a murderous blow to the head with a coupling pin. Captain Hone, Facing two revolvers in his face, sprang to his feet, drew his revolver, the car lamps were knocked out, and a firefight ensued with 20 shots being fired. Two shots struck Captain Hone, one in the right arm and one in the hip. Hulligan was dragged from the car, 
the handcuff key taken from his pocket, and the prisoner freed. The gang then disappeared into the darkness. We're currently sitting in the 90 car at Midwest Railway Preservation Society. This car is built in 1930, so it was built some years after the Blinky Morgan incident on the rail yard. The seats were probably fixed, but by the same token, rail cars had not gotten any wider than this. They can't. And for two detectives and a prisoner to sit in a section of seats and then have four people trying to jump on two people. You're looking at approximately the same uh, amount of space that they had and everybody taking a swing at everybody. Um, that's pretty, uh, pretty rough concept there. I don't know how they could have gotten at one another like that. The, the count that I saw of the whole deal said that a guy had a, a piece of metal wrapped up in a newspaper and that's what he hit the detective over the head with and killed him. Uh, from the accounts, it sounded like one of the old link pins from the old link and pin couplers that they used to have. That we, we have knuckles nowadays. This is what we use for couplers today. What happens is there'll be another one like this on the car that hooks up to it, and they'll come together just like your two hands, and that's a coupling, okay? Back in that day, there was like a link in the chain. It was about that long, slot in the middle, and there was a slot inside the car. The brakeman would take and hold that link in there and put a pin in it, and he'd stand there, and when the engine backed in, he'd try and get it in the opposing slot and drop the pin all at once and get out of there before he got crushed. Watch this. You think that's, that's, that's bad? Okay, you see this hand wheel here? They used to be vertical and they'd stand up and the brakeman would run the tops of the cars. When the engineer called for the brakes, he'd give the signal for the brakes and signal how many brakes he wanted set and the brakeman would run the tops of the cars setting the brakes. One thing and another, the average lifespan of a brakeman at that time was about two and a half years. And that's how they used to do things back in the 1880s. All right, how did he get a hold of a pin? Well, you know, those darn pins were everywhere. And uh, it wouldn't have been too hard for him to have picked up a pin in a rail yard someplace that got jiggled off of a car or dropped. And not hard at all. They're all the time losing stuff off the railroad. And that's probably what the guy had was one of those uh, link pins uh, and hit the fellow over the head with it, uh, who then eventually died from his injuries. And of course there was some shooting went on and in a confined space somebody pulling a pistol and shooting, that's not a wonderful thing either. Uh, so yeah, that was a tough little tussle right there. like to know if he had somebody waiting at that uh, station with horses. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had to have something to get away with. Because when you look at the map of Ravenna from then, there's like four or five train stations. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to believe that... They could go step on another train and... Yeah, so it's like, yeah, they had to have, well, they had to have something. Newspapers all say that they just ran down the track and into the night. And I thought to myself, they had to have had some way to escape, which meant that they probably had somebody out in the woods someplace with horses so that they could get away. And again, 
how did Blinky and his gang, how did they know what train and how many policemen were going to be with Kid McMahon? How did they know? You know, how did they know where to hit? You know, they got on the train at Alliance. They went into the, um, into the ladies' car. The ladies' car meaning that they didn't smoke in there. And, the, and Detective Hulligan and Henry Holm, the two cops, and Kid McMunn were in the smoking car. Ravenna, that's when, they, that's when they hit. They could certainly know the times of the trains, but how did they know which train and which day? So somebody had to have, you know, had to have told them. Yeah, because it's not like in Pittsburgh that they just sat there and scoped out the train station, like, oh, there he is, let's get on this train. Yeah. It was, they picked it up in Alliance yeah. after, mm -hmm. you know, they yeah. already left. And then yes. it was like a midnight train, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, it was around, what, 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, something like that, yeah. At some point, the detectives saw some sketchy characters. Was it a conductor? One of the trainmen saw some kind of sketchy characters, and they told Henry Hone. But then it didn't say anything, you know, about what Hone was going to do, although I'm sure that he was alerted. Both police officers were armed. You know, I don't know what they could have done at that point. And Hone was, um, what was he, shot three times? He was shot in the hip, and he had been beaten in the head, and Hulligan was beaten in the head. No, it just seemed like there's a lot of tension that would have been built up, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. here you are suing something, and it's so late at night, you're not really on your game, you would think. I'm sure, yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, I found it. I'm sure. Just thinking about the tension that was taking place. Like, I think these guys might, you know. And then, but they were, um, you know what? They were bad people. They were bad men. And they had to have had a lot of nerve. And I think that's one thing that, uh, you know, that criminals have is a lot of nerve. Now, they may not be the kind of nerve, the right kind of nerve, but uh, Blinky Morgan sure did have, you know, he had guts of, of uh, some type. Because, see, there were other people in that car. One was a minister, as I remember. There were a couple of women that uh, turned out later were probably prostitutes. And they had to know that they were going to have to get into that car and control the situation. See, the first thing that they did when they got on the train was they knocked out the lights. So, you know, people couldn't see. And, you know, and people are in shock. They, you know, they don't know what they've seen, you know. And even today, the police will tell you if, uh, um, if they interview 10 different witnesses to a crime, they're going to get 10 different stories. Though it is not known conclusively if Blinky was present on the prisoner busting train that cost Holligan his life, it is without a reasonable doubt that Blinky, with his crew, had holed up in Michigan in a flop house where they were making plans to escape to Canada. It is here where Sheriff Lynch and his able bodied staff surprised Blinky with a raid. The sheriff and his men had been closely monitoring the building where Blinky was staying. At the decided time of the raid, Sheriff Lynch was the first to enter the room, and he dashed at the startled Blinky, who was sitting behind a table. Though caught off guard and in the grips of Sheriff Lynch, Blinky was able to grab his 44 pistol and started shooting. Lynch held his arm, but he caught a bullet right above the knee. Blinky was finally secured by Lynch's men, and they were also able to catch his accomplices. After locking Blinky and his men in a Michigan jail cell, a steamer was arranged to transport them back to Ohio, where they would be tried. By the time the steamer arrived at the Ohio dock at 6.15 a.m., there was a crowd of more than 2,000. Though the Blinky shooting of Sheriff Lynch was not immediately fatal, he died a few days later from the blood poisoning as a result of the bullet. Blinky protested he didn't know if the men who had burst in his room on that day were robbers or thugs with intent to harm him. He said he didn't know it was the law and he was just trying to defend himself. By the time Blinky was brought before the judge to render his plea, the courthouse in Ravenna was filled to capacity. 
newspaper accounts from that time noted there were a number of ladies packing the courtroom so they could catch a glimpse of this notorious man. Blinky was dressed in a suit and a white tie and held himself in perfect posture and spoke very little. Blinky was asked by the judge, guilty or not guilty? To which Blinky replied, not guilty. The judge set the trial date for October 10th, 1887. The trial was a spectacle. The prosecution had plenty of witnesses, and as each spoke, Blinky's attorney, Sam Eddy, found ways to discredit the accounts. As it was at the arraignment, the trial courtroom was packed, mostly with women. Blinky, always the showman, dressed in a suit and a white tie and held his head high. He would often lean back in his chair and rock back and forth while the business was being conducted. Blinky, during this time, and very conscious of the need to appear as a gentleman, petitioned the judge to permit him to be allowed to shave. When it was time for Sam Eddy to defend his client, it got weird. Eddy never called any witnesses, nor did he offer any closing argument. No one is sure why he did this. It could be that he and Blinky were under the mistaken belief of the obviousness of Blinky's innocence. It could be that Eddie was trying to set up a reason to have the case declared a mistrial. Perhaps it could have been even a darker reason. Maybe Eddie, who sensed the bloodlust from the public, wanted to keep his reputation intact and simply went through the basic motions of being the legally mandated defense attorney. We will never know. The jury took less than an hour and a half to return their verdict. Guilty. When the foreman announced this verdict, reporters noticed that Blinky smiled. It appeared that he did not expect to be given the ultimate sentence, death by hanging. After the verdict, Blinky was transported to the Ohio Penitentiary in Columbus. Most of the clothing worn by Blinky and the men during this period would be fairly boring. Black wool, gray wool, and part of the reason of that is because the environment in which they lived was very dirty. There was coal used for heating, coal used for train, and the streets were not paved. They had not only dirt, but filth, because people didn't have the same types of sanitation that we have today. But one place that men might have a little jazz, and Blinky might have some bling, is on his waistcoat or vest. And this one is made of silk velvet, and it has a printed pattern and so Blinky would have most definitely be wearing a vest like this and he was he was dressed all fancy and for he the was gallows, dressed, right? yes yes he was he had a white tie on a white bow tie and he even had a boot knee he was styling all he the was, way till yes, the end yes he was going to style all the way to the end there are also clues and things, this, the rustle of a fabric that might be for a writer oh, very yes. important or very, the squeak yes. of a shoe. So clothing is, is not just visual and tactile, there's also so, the sound, there's even the smell, uh -huh, the smell of, the, of it yes. and the way that people carry themselves. Let's say a man wearing a t-shirt or a man wearing a suit and a tie will walk different, will sit different right. and as a writer those are important details. Those are important that, things, yeah. yes, yes. When trying to break the neck during a hanging, the length of rope is crucial. Too short, and instead of breaking the neck, the recipient of the hanging suffocates to death, sometimes taking up to 30 minutes. Too long of a rope can lead to the decapitation of the head. Blinky requested a 10-foot rope. That request was denied, and a much shorter rope was implemented. Despite the few attempts for an appeal, and with some minor delays, Blinky's hanging was finally scheduled for August 3rd, 1888. He requested and was allowed to wear a nice suit, replete with a white cravat and a flower in his lapel. Warden Coffin would grant Blinky's final wishes. Select lawmen would not be permitted to witness his execution. Moments before the execution, those lawmen disobeyed his wish. A hood was placed over his head and the noose around his neck. Blinky was asked about any last words. He simply said farewell to his girlfriend with, 
Goodbye, Nellie. The trap door was opened at 1.22 a.m. The fall through the trap door failed to do its work. It took 24 long minutes before Charles Blinky Morgan would succumb to the noose. Blinky was buried. The furs were never recovered. So Blinky's story ends with him hanging by his neck. But that is not the end of the story. Stories about crime tend to be neatly tied up in black and white jurisprudence. Guilty or not guilty. But life isn't ever that neat. Blinky did some bad things, but we're not sure of all the bad things. Blinky paid for at least some of his crimes, and for a while, Blinky was a name on the nation's lips. Whether that was a name of infamy or gallantry. I suppose it depends on the kind of person you are, or perhaps the way in which you heard the stories. There remain a number of unanswered questions in Blinky's story and many dead ends, but not the kind that hang from a rope. The crime had cost three men their lives and fueled the news cycle for a year or so. But time does what time does, and crime does what crime does, and soon more grisly crimes captured the public's attention, and the passage of time made Blinky's escapades a footnote in history. But what happens to these footnotes? What happens when we look down the page or in the filing cabinets and wipe off the dust of these deleted tales? For me, the story is still there. It is living and breathing and connects itself to our lives through centuries and miles. And isn't that the thing about stories? They may be forgotten, but they're never gone.